Hello random stranger and my Hoseki no Kuni peoples. Today we're going to be watching or I mean rather tackling the final episode of Land of the Lustrous. It's kind of hard to believe that it's been one month since I posted that very first crappily shot and edited reaction to episode one because honestly it feels like it's been one year <laughs> um, emotionally and also intellectually. I never expected an anime to take me down so many different rabbit holes, never expected to be given so much um, brain food and contemplations around so many different philosophical topics. But the coolest thing I've learned from doing these reactions is just how kind this fandom is. It's been like being able to tap into both a mind hive and also an emotional support group all wrapped into one. Really, I'm so thankful to you guys that you would take the time to one, even watch these videos, and two, to help me more easily process the lore and the feelings and all the general what the heckness this show throws at you by pointing out, you know, neat little additional facts or just bouncing ideas around in the comments. So here we go, one last recap of the last episode, uh, along with some interesting thoughts from you guys in the comments I want to highlight. I have a feeling that this one is going to be a long one, so if you just want to skip straight to the reaction, there's a timestamp down below. First, let's talk about Shiro, the giant Lunarian uh, goth fingernailed dog creature and what I think it reveals about Sensei. We know Sensei was close to Shiro and that he knew them before they began sprouting human features. My theory is that Shiro, while on the moon, was uh, combined together with bits of the captured gems and the Admirabilis, and so began this transformation into human form but for some reason never quite completed the transition. The interesting thing that Super Quacked Up pointed out is that there were 108 fluffy little cloud puppies in total that made up Shiro. 108 is a sacred number in Buddhism. There's about like a dozen or so interpretations of what it means, but one iteration of it is that in Japan, uh, at the end of each new year, Buddhist temples will ring a bell 108 times to sort of uh, usher in the new year. And each ring represents an earthly temptation that a person must overcome in order to achieve nirvana. And that's key because we can now reasonably assume that Shiro found nirvana when they vanished into thin air because Sensei tells Foss that he didn't return to the moon but rather found peace. Which implies then that those on the moon, i.e. the Lunarians that are still hunting them, aren't at peace yet. This then, in, in my mind, sets up a really fascinating conflict of interest because it's pretty clear that Sensei wants the Lunarians to find peace, like he's sad when he has to destroy them, but what if they can only ever achieve nirvana or peace by rediscovering their humanity by consuming the gems and the Admirabilis? So while it seems as though Sensei is protecting the gems, there's also this underlying weirdness that he wants the Lunarians to achieve Nirvana as well, and those two goals might not be compatible with each other. So this is just me spouting off crazy ideas again, just based on what the anime has shown me. I know that a lot of these answers will be in the manga, which is why I'm sort of looking forward to checking those out afterwards. If you've watched my reactions from the start, you'll know that I've now done a complete 360, not even a 180, like a 360 on my thoughts around Sensei. So I started out being suspicious of him because he was so adamant which roles the gems should and shouldn't have and seemingly kept the knowledge of their descendancy from the humans um, under lock and key. Then it was, oh, he means well, he really loves the gems and he just wants to protect them. But now that we know of this strange connection with the Lunarians and that all of the gems except Foss knew about this but have never really questioned it, I'm now back to being an uncomfortable, whoa, Sensei is being super dodgy. It reminds me of those conformity experiments that they do in psychology. So basically they put uh, 10 people in a room and they ask them really simple, basic questions for example, what does two plus two equal? Nine of those people are actually plants. So they are clued in on the experiment and purposefully as a group give ridiculous answers like two plus two equals five. And usually what happens is the 10th person in that group who has no idea what's going on eventually begins accepting this alternative reality even though it doesn't uh, line up with the basic facts. It's not quite a one-on-one -on -one analogy, but in the context of the show, 
Foss is that one person who's like looking around at all the other gems and saying, wait a minute, something doesn't add up, but why isn't anyone doing anything about it? What's so cool about Foss being the one yearning for the truth is that their legs are from the Admirabilis shell and the gold that's infused with them is made up of ancient organisms that connect them to the humans. That's why they cry tears of gold um, and when they're questioning the truth and stressing over how their world maybe isn't what it appears to be, the gold bursts out of Foss because that's that's just the most human of things, right? Our natural curiosity and our ability to question widely accepted conventions and truths. And I think Foss is taking on that very human-esque quality of not being afraid to upset the apple cart. So this is a, um, definitely a turning point in the story, like uh, Nago Arubarus said. So they wrote, here the show and continuing on in the manga, begins introducing a new theme that twines around its continuing questions of change and its consequences. Suspicion and its consequences. Yes, a major, major ramping up of the suspicion. Like change, suspicion or skepticism is not itself good or bad, but can lead to both healthy and unhealthy places. Yeah, totally. Like we don't know where this quest for truth will take Foss, uh, whether it's going to a better or worse place, uh, it's possible that it could be both. But Foss is now waiting for the Linearians to show up so they can just ask them, hey, what's the deal? And it struck me that waiting for the Linearians is something that Cinnabar has been doing since episode one. And um, Amelia Lees wrote something that made me think more about this really uh, important difference between Foss and Cinnabar. So they mentioned... Um, the importance of having a purpose for the gems. So for example, with Rutile, um, it's possibly that they look at fixing Padpa as their one driving purpose rather than an old friend who they love, which is sort of what I thought based on what I saw in the last episode. With Bort, clearly it's their fighting and with Alex, it's their Lunarian research. And then Amelia writes in relation to purpose, that's where Floss and Cinnabar are different. Both were deemed useless and were unable to find such a purpose. What separates them is Foss's persistence. And yep, absolutely. They're both waiting for the Lunarians to show up, but the difference is that Cinnabar is doing it because they've lost all hope of ever being a useful gem with a fulfilling purpose. Whereas Foss is waiting to ask the Lunarians about the truth with a capital T. The last thing I want to flag is Padpa the whole written gem. What is the story there? Do they just naturally shed bits of themselves due to the defect in their body not allowing them to permanently take on the inclusions? The fact that several of you have mentioned Padba as a fan favorite has already sent like this huge red flag in my mind. I'm going to do my best not to get attached to them this episode because I know that it's not going to end well and if it does then I can be pleasantly surprised. I have come a long way from being all like Foss is going to help Cinnabar find their one true purpose and they'll both live happily ever after kind of mindset. See this is what this show does to you and the main way that I deal with the pain of reality is to be able to rant about it too and with you guys. All right, I'm good to go. If you guys are as well, let's do this in three, two, one, go. <laughs> like the reflections. The hair. Marty looks surprised that this actually worked. Oh wow, their voice is, it's like very mature. I think they're as old as yellow. Oh my God. <sighs> See, I can't help but feel like Rito really deeply, deeply cares for Papa. Okay, but then maybe that is their purpose. Like it's making sure that they can fix the gems and Papa is the one that really was a roadblock to that. A <laughs> little pebble. Just like me. Except Foss can accept inclusions a lot easier. That's the head pat that 
they always wanted from Sensei, but still. <laughs> Exhaustion. So, Rutil used to fight with Padva. Oh. So, Fuzz always gets paired up with the fan favorites. That is not a good sign. They're so cool, so suave. Being honest. I feel like Padba is the kind to be like, go for it, girl. <laughs> wow. Oh, there's some, there's some deep, I don't know, self hatred there as well. Yeah, you can't really go back. Oh, that lighting that turned real dark real quick. Don't tell me that is literally all we get of Padpa. Oh my god. So they're keeping Rutil out. And I don't think Rutil believes them. But just intimidating each of the gems one by one. There's that metamorphosis symbol again. They're on the edge of something. And see, Cinnabar didn't offer to help Foss's mission to find out the truth. It's kind of a very passive stance. That is some heavy symbolism. <laughs> That's very different from how Bort treated Foss, though. Oh, God. Plus this lady, don't worry. That's just how they are. It was a meteoric rise. Now the pressure's on them. No. <laughs> but, oh, God, I mean, in some way it does make sense for them to go down that path, but no, that is so dark. I hope this doesn't set a precedent. Like, Foss has gone through hell. It's kind of what Foss wanted, but then it's totally not what they wanted. 
like the price has been so high. Isn't that kind of bored talking about themselves though in relation to Daya? So they're saying they can be more efficient by not partnering with Daya. And I think Daya kind of knew that as well. It's so sad. They're the oldest. <laughs> I love their kid antics. This happy music and just this whole, you know, joking around is so dissonant with the whole darkness of the show. Now everyone has to deal with the board stealing their partners. So yellow stuck with the desk job now. Putting on another happy face. I was yellow's idea. Because she feels bad for the partners that they've lost. So Padpa seems to be kind of like the sage one, the wise one that everyone kind of kind of turns to for advice. I love that they have a library. Alex is like, yes. Oh no. Oh, okay, here we go. Is Bort like remaking the shape of um, <laughs> sort of the ice flow? It's a shame they lost all of that stuff that happened in the ocean with King. Oh, wow. Was this like preschool? <gasps> when Foss was first born. Okay, so they've always kind of been like the center of attention and not always for the good reason. Oh, it's baby Foss. They have a kind heart. <laughs> so they also play dress up as sensei. These kids, honestly. Who's sleeping on top of the, is that yellow? They're such a nerd, I love them. <laughs> yep, it's yellow sleeping on the papers. Cram session.
fast does though. Sensei does. Their Hulk out condition. God, they're all just suffering from personal trauma. Like personal and collective trauma. Finally. Or oh, are they going to go with the Lenarians? Oh, God. No weapons. Come on, use your arms. They've got so much better control now. Kind of like what happened the first time with Antark. Oh God, just... Ugh. Are they going to commit murder? Oh, oh, so... wait, does Foss want Cinnabon saving them? Oh, God. Yeah, no. Yeah, they didn't get the answers that they wanted. Foss is going to be pissed. I don't know the whole choking thing. That wasn't, that wasn't really in character for Foss. Or at least, yeah, the old Foss. This is a new Foss, so. I have a feeling Cinnabar knew... Oh yeah, it's not night time. But yeah, I was going to say, I think Cinnabar kind of knew what Foss was up to and was like, cut that idea out of your mind right now. For the for her sake, for their sake, but... <laughs> That's what Cinnabar did in the beginning as well, made the little model of Foss. I love all these full circle things. But yeah, what new work? Have they been studying the Lenarians as well? Just secretly? I wanna know what's happening so badly. <laughs> Is this where they wait for the Lenarians? <laughs> With the net and the lasso. <laughs> you can't run, you can't run from that. Whoa. Oh, help me find the truth. Yes. I am so down for a Cinnabar and Foss team up. Just to uncover the whole 
whatever it is that's happening with Sensei and the Lunarians. The exact words. She remembers every single word. I mean, it could be fun, you know, tearing down the edifice of the society that you've always known your whole life. Okay, at least Foss is being honest. Maybe that might work. <laughs> the malleable gems teaming up. as malleable as you know their arms this reality please go with her cinnabar i don't think she's thought that far yeah why do i feel like i'm watching them break up You're both. I mean, she did find a new purpose in a way. I love that Foss is walking downwards from Cinnabar. They're kind of like descending into, you know, the, the dark. And Cinnabar's close to the moonlight. Foss is so determined though. The more you know, the more um, you know how much you don't know, I guess. What is that? Distrust is exactly why Foss is finding you. They need that. That's such a beautiful shot. Yeah. <laughs> Yellow hasn't moved. Are you sleeping on those? Oh, there are those replicas of the little cloud dogs. <laughs> That's obsidian. Oh, dire. What was, what was that? Okay, still thinking about Boat, just partnering off with everyone except them. <laughs> I think sweat. Okay, why are they showing all these like normal, everyday life, happy things? Sensei. Does he know something about Foss? Do not trust this happy music. This is the very first scene. <sighs> what are they gonna do? Oh my gosh, this is 
callback. Oh god, I miss that boss so much. <sighs> but they were happy. Aren't we all in some way? I feel like Sensei knows something. Oh gosh, she's gonna deceive him now. That's it, isn't it? That's it. <laughs> Manga, that is my next stop. Oh, man. I can't, there's got to be a season two to this. I still, I can't believe we only got Padpa for, I think it was about three minutes. <laughs> But that was a very important three minutes because I feel like they gave Foss the push to be like, yes, do it. You know, there's this weird um, unseemly thing going on behind the scenes and you need to be the one to uncover it. Oh, man. Well, everything has kind of come full circle in this last episode. I loved the very last scene is a callback to the very first one, although it did hurt seeing Kid Foss staring at themselves in the water's reflection and then right behind we see Sad Foss there. That was just like the ultimate statement that we have irretrievably lost Foss's innocence and now they're going to embark on a mission that could potentially put everything they know and love and have at risk. That was also some cliffhanger to end on with Sensei calling for Foss. Um, whatever goodwill I had for him is pretty much spent right now. Even if he has a justifiable reason for not sharing the truth, the gems, at this point it's caused so much uh, confusion over their identities and purpose that it doesn't really matter. Like, it's not just Foss, it's it's like Yellow questioning what it is they've been fighting for for all this time. Obviously Cinnabar is just clinging on to dear life without a clear purpose. It's, it's all of them suffering from this continued, seemingly meaningless hunt for their lives. And then having to live with survivor's guilt and with the loss of really close partners. All of that without a clear answer as to when and how they can end it. As I said before, the precious few moments we got with Padpa were so critical. They signaled to Foss that they weren't crazy to want to get to the bottom of things, but they also gave Foss a really, um, like some really shrewd words of advice like how to act in front of Sensei and even the other gems. So like when Foss kind of fobs off Rutil when they ask Foss what they talked about with Padpa. Had this series continued, it would have made for such an explosive second season because this is such a perfect end to the overall first arc of the story where Foss is stripped down to the bare bones, singular drive to uncover Sensei's omission of the truth or possibly even deception. If anyone has an alternate view on Sensei, please do let me know because I'd love to hear like a different, maybe a more benevolent side to him. With regards to Cinnabar, it's a little bit left up in the air as to whether or not they decide to join Foss in their quest, but I am pretty confident the way they left things that yes, they are on board. They already have their distrust there and they know that something is wrong and I think they just needed someone like Foss to kind of lead the way or be the instigator, given how passive Cinnabar is. So I love the idea of the both of them somehow, I don't know, just hitching a ride with the Lanarians, uh, you know, to f kind of find out the truth, see where they live, what's up with, you know, their side of the story. By the way, that scene where Foss is strangling one of the Lanarians, it's obvious that Foss could understand the words that they were trying to gasp out. 
and they might have gotten a huge reveal had it not been for Cinnabar's intervention. Also, somehow that scene managed to paint the Lunarians in a kind of sympathetic light, even though they were still doing the same old thing of shooting arrows and, you know, trying to break the gems, which was, um, I don't know, it was, it was strange. If I had to think about whether any of the other gems would join Foss and Cinnabar to expose Sensei's secrets, I really think maybe only Alex would give any sort of assistance, you know, maybe in the form of a secret Lunarian pamphlet she's been hiding and keeping from Sensei. Maybe Yellow as well, just because they seem to be on the same wavelength as Padpa, and they've just been around for so long that anything that would change the status quo would be welcome because they just want out of this whole never-ending cycle of violence and persecution. I would be less confident in Bort and Dyer, um, even though I love those two, just because Bort is so by the book and is solely focused on the efficiency of the fight against the Lunarians. And Dyer, well, because they would follow Bort into hell if they had to, and I don't think they'd break from any of Bort's decisions. By the way, it was really cute to see Zircon go to Foss for advice on how to make Bort like me. <laughs> it was just so... Well, it was another reminder that we no longer have the same Foss with us, which is both good and bad. All right, I, I need to take some time to sort of let that last episode sink in, and I'm really looking forward to meeting you guys in the comments section to sort of suss everything out. I can say, though, that this is not the end of the Hoseki no Kuni journey for me. I will be finishing off my reactions for A Place Further Than the Universe, and stay tuned for an update video after that that will also include what animes I'll be reacting to next, uh, both of them, by the way, which were recommendations in the comments from you guys, which um, I'm pretty excited about, uh, as well as some more Land of the Luscious stuff I'm planning to dig into. Until then, I really just want to finish off by saying thank you again uh, from Australia and the bottom of my heart. Just thank you for making this such an enjoyable, enriching experience. I look forward to in the future having you join me on a different reaction series, but you know, if not, it was so awesome to have you on this particular crazy ride. I really hope that you take care and unlike Foss, that you are living your best life and that it's a happy one. I'll see you guys soon.